Okay, this is an interview with Anthony Bacciri, the uh, Hampton Inn, Newburgh, New York, January 8th, uh, 2003, approximately 1245. Uh, the interviewer is Michael Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, your date of birth, and place of birth, please? Anthony Joseph Bacciri, born October the 6th, 1924, in Troy, New York. Okay, what was your uh, pre-war, your pre-military pre service education? Well, I was in high school. I went to a lot of schools in Connecticut as a youngster, and I moved, uh, father remarried after my mother passed away, and I moved up to Marlboro. And I went from a city kid to a country boy, farm boy. And uh, in school, we used to work part-time at the local diners, dishwasher, and things like that. And uh, I was just very active in the Boy Scouts, re received the rank of Eagle Scout. Mm -hmm. And right after that, of course, Pearl Harbor came along. And I was in the uh, diner working at night when the, when the word came out that uh, Pearl Harbor was bombed. And at the time, we, where's Pearl Harbor? You know, we didn't really realize it, being 17. And, and uh, even though uh, I always enjoyed history and things of that sort in school. But uh, it was just working on a farm, scouting, that was the only real recreation you had, playing ball at the school field, soccer, basketball, whatever track. Okay, um, were you, did you enlist or were you drafted? No, I enlisted uh, when I, right after Pearl Harbor, uh, I asked my father, says, I'm gonna join the Navy, I don't wanna be in the Army. And he says, well, that's up to you. He says, I'd rather not see you go, but... So I went up to uh, Poughkeepsie. At that time, that's where they were recruiting. And uh, they signed me up, and he says, you'll get orders later on. But I went back to school in September, and uh, I, uh, while I was in school as a, as a junior, I received my orders to report to New York City, the Navy uh, station down there. And uh, uh, September the 21st, I was in the Navy on my way to Newport, Rhode Island, Quonset Point. And uh, it took just 21 days of boot camp, and out we went. I think it's one of the, the only groups that only went through the minimum of training that there was possible, 21 days. And uh, I went to uh, diesel, advanced diesel engineering school in Richmond, Virginia for about eight weeks. And uh, I was assigned to a ship, which is uh, USS Tuscaloosa, and uh, chased it up and down the coast to finally catch up to it. And I went aboard ship, it was around midnight. And with that, uh, my assignment on a ship, believe it or not, was not diesel engineering, but steam boilers. Went from one thing, it's like putting a butcher in to become a shoemaker, you know. But uh, that's the way it was, and I spent the rest of the time in the boiler room. Mm -hmm. What, what uh, was the Tuscaloosa? It's a heavy cruiser. Heavy cruiser, okay. Right. In fact, uh, the cruiser, uh, we've been involved with, uh, at the time, uh, President Roosevelt had been aboard ship. It was like a cruise ship for him. And we escorted Churchill several times across the Atlantic when they had meetings uh, between Roosevelt and Churchill. And uh, then the rest of it is just going from uh, one station to another, uh, invasions and so forth. What uh, invasions were you involved with? Well, we went into North Africa. Uh, that started it off. And then we, uh, we patrolled uh, the North Atlantic and went to Murmansk, Russia, uh, with uh, some of the convoys. And we went into what we call the Arctic Circle, which were about 50 miles from the magnetic North Pole. Uh, after, and, and we didn't realize it was a secret mission at the time. And we were working with the part of the British Home Fleet. And we proceeded down uh, to find that it was a, a prelude to the invasion of Normandy, getting everything ready. Uh, we established a weather station up in Spitsbergen. It's in that little island up there. From there, we, we came back to the States, refurbished, and we were sent back to uh, 
the British Isles. From there, we prepared for the invasion of Normandy. And once that was completed, we were shipped down to the Mediterranean. We went into Sicily for about a month, and then the invasion of southern France, the Riviera section, uh, southern France. And if, uh, we left there, come back to the States, and we, uh, we, we stopped in Hawaii to finish uh, getting supplies and things we needed. And we headed for uh, Iwo Jima, and after that was Okinawa, we went down to the Philippines. And shortly after that, we, uh, we patrolled the North Korean Sea and ended up in Shanghai, China. Now, can we go back to Normandy? Did your ship uh, provide fire uh, oh, yes. support? Yes, uh, we had uh, a local admiral. Well, he, uh, he's from the Dale family, which is located in New Falls. If you go into New Falls, there's a lot of Dales up there. And uh, Rear Admiral Dale was in charge of the, a particular uh, group of ships uh, for the firing and the fire support for the Utah Beach. Did no. you ever get above deck to watch any of the firing? Or? Uh, no, I could hear it all, and that's uh, worse than seeing it. Because you're down, we were about 14 feet below the water level. Uh, people don't realize when they look at a ship, they think that's all they see is there. Mm -hmm. But there's so much of the ship that's in the water. And uh, we were, I was on what they call the A watch, which is the, the primary watch when in combat zone. They always have a relief crew that comes in. We were down at about 5 o'clock in the morning, and uh, we never got out of there until midnight. And uh, if you had to go or something, there was a bucket over in the corner with lime in it, and that's what you did what you did. Uh, it's very convenient. But uh, I thank God that uh, during that time of the invasion, we had ships that were hit with, uh, with the German... Uh, Air Force, we had, they uh, used to drop floating mines. A lot of times the mines are anchored in a certain area, but these were just floating. And one of our brand new destroyers just came out, hit that mine, and down it went. And our ship never received one hit of any kind. We were very fortunate. And none of the other ships around us were getting hit with one thing or another. How about at uh, Iwo Jima and, and uh, Okinawa? You've Provided fire support yes, there also? Yes, we were a fire support ship. Our inch guns were calibrated to, uh, outside of the Missouri, I think we had a rifling in the guns that were more perfect than most uh, guns that these ships had. Uh, we could fire almost 35 miles at almost that pinpoint. That's uh, the distance, and it was proved many times. But... Uh, all the islands we did support them, and uh, of course at Iwo Jima, uh, when you hit the beach, it's just one big black cloud come up because of the black sand that was there. And uh, of course uh, we had spotters, as they call them, fire controlmen. They would tell you where designated targets were, and that's what the batteries would fire at. Mm -hmm. Did you? Uh were you above deck at all at Iwo Jima or Okinawa? Uh, yeah, we went up uh, for a breathing spell, more or less. Uh, like I say, we're primary crew was let come up. Once you get down in the boiler room, on the steel deck that's there, there's a hatch that's maybe about three foot square. They Once they dog that down, you can't get out. Even if you turn them, there's a guy up on top turning them, closing them down. Because mm -hmm. that was more or less, if there was a hit below the water line, that water containment would be in just that particular part of the ship. And that's the reason for everything being so airtight. Did you see any of the uh, kamikaze attacks at all? At yeah. Okinawa? yeah, we've seen, uh, in fact, uh, I happened to be on, on deck uh, when there was an uh, aerial attack by the kamikazes, and our gunners hit one plane. Unfortunately, that, that pilot just steered into the the fantail, is, that's the end of the ship, back end, and it hit the gun crew that was there, a 40 mm gun crew, and wiped them right out. But again, we were fortunate never got a hit. Did you, uh, were you near Okinawa at the time of the typhoon? No, we just missed that. Mm 
we just missed that. Halsey uh, was going north towards Japan at, at the time, I think, and uh, we were with a, the, the fleet, whoever the Admiral was, it became the, the 5th Fleet or the 7th Fleet. Depends on what Admiral had it. And uh, we went from the 5th Fleet to 7th Fleet. We were still the same fleet, but with different uh, commanders. Mm -hmm. um, you were also involved in the Philippine uh, Liberation? Yes. We went in there pretty much after the landings took place, but we still went in. And uh, there was a lot of uh, small stuff that had to be taken care of. And... We kind of, uh, but we did manage to get into uh, Manila uh, just for a few hours. I was able to get ashore and went down into uh, uh, Corregidor where uh, General Wainwright surrendered and all. And I saw the, the conditions that were there and the guns that they had. Were, actually, the guns were antiquated to begin with. There was much defense there. And we went into... Uh, uh, on the other side of the island, or the peninsula, so to speak, and uh, just more or less support uh, any uh, resistance that may have been along the various islands, and that was about it. And I noticed you also were involved in the uh, China India Burma. Yeah, we you went. How were you well, in we that? come down from. Uh, uh, North, the fact at that time I didn't know what Korea was. Now we hear about it, a lot of it today. But we come down along the Korean Peninsula and help uh, uh, land some Marines in there to kind of liberate the little areas around there. Uh, there was no real gunfire from us, but the Marines that we landed took care of whatever they had to. And then uh, we ended up down in uh, Shanghai, China. We were there for a couple of months, more or less as a support group all the way around. And uh, at that time, the, the war was over, but we still maintained a certain amount of security and patrolling. And we picked up uh, roughly about 500 uh, troops, Army Air, Army Air Corps, and uh, we brought them back to the States. And that's how I got involved with China and Burma, India. Now, did you stay on the same ship? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, I was, from the time I went aboard, uh, I stayed here until, uh, excuse me, to uh, December, I can't remember the exact date, it was about a week before Christmas that we, uh, we ended up in San Francisco and uh, Treasure Island and we, they transferred us and we were being ready to be discharged and they put us on, uh, I would call a cattle train. I think the cattle got more better treatment than we did. And uh, we traveled across the country. It took us over five days to get back to uh, New York. They shipped us out to uh, Lido Beach, which was a separation center for the Navy. And we got in on Christmas Eve. And they said, nobody goes home. Why? Well, we have to separate you and do this and do that. Then finally, a few hours later, they... Uh, Decided, well, you can come home, but you have to be back by midnight, Christmas night. So everybody scrambled and headed for trains and so forth and hitchhiked, whatever way we could get home. But it was the 27th of December, they finally gave us our papers, which they could have done on the 24th. Um, there's one other question I had, and I can't think what it was. I can't believe that. Do you, do you know what happened to your ship? Eventually. Yeah, eventually, uh, 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 several years later, it, uh, they made one or two more trips down to uh, the Carolina Islands down around the South Pacific to pick up more troops and people to bring back. They were using every ship they could to bring back the crew. Our crew went from 1,200 to about seven or 800, and they made room for all the, these men that were coming back. Uh, they scrapped it. Uh, I guess it you may have shaped uh, with the razor blades for all I know since then. But uh, one of the uh, iron works of, uh, that supplies Gillette Razor Company and all of it, steel, uh, they're the ones that uh, eventually bought the steel, and it was decommissioned. They did take off the mask of the ship, a five-inch gun, the ship's bell, and one other item, and uh, 
they transported it back to Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And I happened to see it because our last ship's reunion, which was in September, October this year, uh, past year, and I was able to uh, see uh, the mask and the five-inch gun and the ship's bell, which is in the city hall. Uh, it's in a regular Veterans Memorial Park, right in the main section of uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And it was our last ship's reunion also. How many times did you cross the equator? Several times. I can't tell you exactly how many times. but uh, Can you Tell us about your first time across. Well, I'll tell you, they restricted uh, some of the usual uh, uh, initiations because of uh, combat zone and so forth. Mm -hmm. They did go through uh, a few preliminary things. I think I became a polywog and a few other things. Uh, uh, Neptune, I think I still have a card in my uh, uh, scrapbook. But, uh, like I say, a lot of things were cut short because of the fact we were constantly on alert all the time. But we do remember some guys had two birthdays and some had none. because the international dateline going across. Okay, um, so you left the service in 1945. Did right. you go into the reserves? Or? I went into the reserve a little while after that uh, through the <coughs> urging of my cousin, who's a it could almost be twins because they're only a couple of months apart. He said, oh yeah, join the reserves and so forth and so on. So I did. He got out and I, got, and I was brought in. And then, of course, five years later, uh, I was on active duty. And then I left the active duty part of it. And uh, I was working for a national company. And I got recalled. Uh, I got, in fact, I went in back, got my orders in August, and I reported back into the Navy around September, almost the same time as I did for World War II. Which seems to be a coincidence, but, uh, and I uh, spent... This is of 1950? 50, right. And uh, what kind of ship, what did you serve on? Uh, I went aboard a destroyer, and uh, that's about half the size of the, the cruiser. I, uh, about six months later, they decided, we were patrolling the East Coast. We were down into Havana, Cuba, and places like that, Bermuda. And uh, they decided to decommission four destroyers. They gave two to the Greek Navy and two to the Italian Navy. Well, the Greek Navy, their two ships went to Boston for a transfer. And the Italian Navy came aboard. Uh, we had 212 men on our ship. Ended up with just 25 of us. And uh, being I could speak Italian and understand it, so I thought. Uh, the Italian crew came aboard and we worked with them for the next six months. And un unfortunately, like I could say, uh, I thought I knew something about Italian language, but with all the dialects from the north to the south to Sicily, uh, it took a while to really find out what they were talking about. It's like talking to a Tennessean and a Texan and a New Englander. It had, the dialects were, you know, they're English or Italian, but it still there's a, mm -hmm. a variation of uh, what they mean and how they talk. Uh, so I you worked, spent approximately a half a year on board with the board, Italian Navy? Right, maybe? right. Uh, we had to, in fact, being in the boiler room, uh, we had to transfer all the equipment and everything else, explain it to the Italian of people that were taking over the boiler room section. In fact, uh, a couple of incidents there, uh, we had a, a, a sound, an explosion. And uh, this other sailor and myself, we made one die for the, uh, for the entrance to the boiler room, which is uh, actually a hatch in the deck. You just slide right down a ladder. Come to find a steam pouring out of the, out of the hatch and the first thing we did, we shut the fires off in the boiler and opened up some valves. Come to find out, they started the fires in the boilers, but never opened up the discharge valves. Well, that caused the back pressure for the safety valves to, to go off. And those things reached about 450 pound pressure or more, and it sounds like a cannon going off. That happened twice. And uh, we told him, says, you do not. Ever try to explain it to him in Italian. 
you don't start a fire without opening up the proper valves. Then we had another one that had uh, almost a close explosion uh, with an air compressor. He says, uh, he was a torpedo man. I said, we don't have any torpedoes on the ship anymore. They took them off. But he was a torpedo man. But he wanted to test the air pressure. Well, he started up the air compressor, which gives out 3,000 pounds of air pressure. And the thing blew the side of the compressor off and built up a pressure. The discharge valve up on deck was closed. So that's the couple of experiences I had with the Italian Navy. And on the, uh, the feeding of them, it seems that the, uh, the men of the Italian Navy uh, used to take them an hour and a half to feed their crew. With the American Navy, 30 minutes and we had everybody fed. Their food was always cold. They had a steam table there, but they never turned the steam on. They used to put the trays in and feed the men. Well, by the time they get fed, the food got cold. So we explained how to do it and what to do for a whole week. The next day they took over, right back to the same routine. Cold food and a long time to feed them. So, and then when they asked me to go uh, on a shakedown cruise, I says, my time is up, I'm going back to the receiving station. And I got off of that. I come to find out later on that they did blow up a boiler, uh, and not in the sense that they exploded, but they burned out some tubes, and the ship had to go back to the Navy Yard to be refitted. But I got off in time. <laughs> What was your next assignment, next ship? Uh, I went on a destroyer escort, which is even smaller. So I, I kept going down, and uh, it's, it registers a little under 200 feet long. And my experience on that was, uh, let me get out of here. That's the way I felt. But, what was uh, it like to have gone the way the ship handled and the engines and so on from a, a, a heavy cruiser to a destroyer to a destroyer escort. Well, let's put it this way. You, you got a Lincoln town car and you get a little Volkswagen. That's about how to put it, really. Uh, you got all the the commodities and everything else and all the built-in stuff in a big uh, Lincoln. And you get down to that little Volkswagen. Sure, it's got four wheels and a motor and everything else, but it's not all there. And that's the kind of feel. When you're out in the ocean, that destroyer escort bounces around three times as much as a heavy cruiser, which is over 10,000 tons, as compared to a couple of thousand. Okay. Um, how long did you stay in the Navy in the 50s? Uh, 18 months. Mm -hmm. okay. um, Um, did you uh, ever use the GI Bill when you left the service? Uh, the only thing I used out of the GI Bill was more or less buying a home. Uh, I did go back to school when I came out of the service the first time, World War II. Uh, and the reason I went back is uh, I was recommended for officers training after a couple of years in the Navy. And when I filled out the application, I found that uh, when I went up to the exec's office and I said, wait a minute, there's one question here I can't fill out properly. And it says, do you have a high school diploma? And I said, well, no, I don't have one because I didn't quit school. I got my notice to report for active duty. Well, that doesn't make any difference. You don't have that piece of paper, you can't go. So when I come back out, I... Uh, made an effort to go back to school. I sat with kids about four years younger than I was and completed the two years necessary uh, credits for graduation. I graduated with a kid that, uh, the kids actually two years after I would normally have graduated. But I did get my diploma and I found that uh, the very first good job that I got into, they said, do you have a high school diploma? Can you pass these tests in math and this, that? And fortunately, I, I was able to. It meant a lot to get that high school diploma. But as far as using the GI itself, uh, I didn't pursue it. In fact, I got married right after I graduated. Uh, that was in July. And it was, uh, well, go out, work and supply, take care of the family. Mm -hmm. Have you kept in any contact with any one that you served with? Well, yes. Uh, we've had ships reunions over the. They've had them since uh, World War II, but uh, I wasn't able to get to them until about 15, 
16 years ago, with my line of work, uh, heavy construction, the time that they were having shift reunion, that's just the height of our work. So I never did get to them. But when I retired, and uh, I was able to go, we've been to places like Chicago, Cincinnati, Denver, Colorado, Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, they've been to Boston, a uh, place in uh, Pennsylvania. And these are the ones that I was able to get to. And the last one, which was this last year, which was our last one, because our group of men uh, were much older than I was to begin with. Some had been in the Navy four or five years before the war broke out. They weren't able to leave, so that put them up in that mid-80s and 90s. Uh, traveling was getting to be more troublesome, and uh, a lot of them were sick and unable. But uh, we've, uh, we've managed to, in fact, there's a fellow out in, uh, on the other end of Sullivan County, Elred. In fact, you just talked to him the other night uh, on the phone. And there's a couple down in Florida we keep in touch with. But we do manage to keep in touch here and there. And, of course, a lot of them have left uh, or passed away uh, over the years that uh, they were more friendly with each other, you know, more buddy-buddies. Everything. Are you active in any veterans organizations? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, I happen to be the commander of the Catholic War Veterans and the China Burma India, both at the same time. And you say why? Because I didn't want the CBI. He says, "But you do this and you can do that." I says, "I can't give you 100 percent time. That's all right. Take it." So that's how I got two commands. But I've been commander in the uh, VFW. Uh, I had seven years as commander. Received six white hats, and uh, with the American Legion. Let's see, one, two, three, four. Yeah, and I'm very active with uh, the Veterans Hospital at Castle Point here. I'm with the. Uh, I'm on the uh, Director's Advisory Board, same as Bob Cahill. There, he just said he, he was around, and uh, we had quite a lengthy meeting yesterday. And. Uh, I've got calls from state representatives and local representatives, uh, elected people that, because I've been so involved with the veterans, they called me up and asked me what they can do for certain people that call them up. And all I do is give them the more or less direction of where to go, who to talk to, and when they come in, I introduce them and then I step out of the picture. Then I leave it up to them. I figured. You talk to him directly, and I'm not going to be your in between, but I'll get you the contacts. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Um, I'll do one final question. How do you think your service had an effect on your life? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I think over the years, I, I haven't forgotten what I've been in, and I think uh, helping. Uh, another fellow veteran, uh, especially if he's in dire need of something, if I can help one person at a time and accomplish something, I feel that satisfaction for me. That's the way I feel. Uh, I've been uh, running in papers or articles and things like that, but uh, it's what I can get for somebody else. Right now I'm working even with the Lions Club, I've been collecting eyeglasses for them with various uh, Lions Club groups. And uh, it's working with other organizations. I feel that if I can do it, I got to some time, I'll do it. Okay. And I'm uh, looking for the future for the younger fellows that are going in the service and those are in, going in right now. Mm -hmm. um, do you have some things to show us? Yep. Yeah. Well, this is the, uh, we were called the, <clears throat> the Black Warrior. And if, come to find out, in Tuscaloosa, they have what they call the Black Warrior River. There happened to be an old uh, Indian there, he was supposed to have been seven foot tall, dark complexion. And uh, the whole thing themes around the Black Warrior. And, it, and the name Tuscaloosa was an Indian name to begin with. Mm -hmm. Of course, they kind of modified it a little bit. 
Uh, incidentally, when we were in Normandy, our uh, code word was uh, Patrick. When we got to southern France, the name became Pasquale. <laughs> but uh, this is my ship in Shanghai, right here. The Yang Yangtze River, Langfu River. So you can see that there's a destroyer alongside of it, you can hardly see it. And this is part of the Italian Navy I was telling you about here. That's when uh, Mayor Palateri was the mayor of New York City. This here is a very fascinating one. This was, now these are tracer bullets. Every third bullet that goes up was mm -hmm. a tracer bullet. And this was the firepower that was going up in uh, Normandy uh, for aircraft. And of course, the others are some private pictures. But uh, I have some, this was in the 25th anniversary of the uh, invasion of Normandy. They had gave us a big, big ride up here. And of course, uh, this was one of the local papers at, uh, with the Tuscaloosa. And this is our crew we're coming into Philadelphia. And we also have, we were in the Reader's Digest about the invasion of Normandy. And uh, and Eisenhower when he was aboard ship and the, oh, the he letter. Oh, was on board your ship? Yeah, he came aboard. Was he? And he uh, gave, wrote, sent a letter to us and it was given to us, printed. And these are some of the pictures I took in China. The young people fed them uh, K rations. Little girls carrying double yoke buckets. And I have uh, Chinese money. And I use these uh, for talking to the school kids, showing the Chinese money, the size of it, and so forth. Filipino, Japanese, French. This is a French note of years ago. And of course, billing cards and so forth. And this was uh, one of our menus that they put out on the ship for Christmas. It was only a month later that they gave us a Christmas uh, dinner. Of course, Christmas Day, they couldn't do it. And uh, just a few articles. And then suddenly I had uh, these two fellows here, one who became my brother-in-law. Yeah. And uh, another fellow, the three of us used to go out together. And then we had, uh, this was the Tuscaloosa America I gave us a picture of all the uh, things that we went through in the, in the Atlantic uh, area. That's one of them. And this is the most recent one that the, the ship's reunion put together. Because they have, uh, they gave each one of us a write-up. Supposed to be myself at about 18 or 19. And this was up in the State Assembly in Albany. And we had, oh, here we are. This was uh, September 1944. Let's see, I can't read it upside down now. That's your shellback card? Shellback, yeah. Shellback, yeah. Right. Okay. And I have the complete history, it was in the encyclopedia, uh, from the time the ship was commissioned and decommissioned. This is the entire story. And of course, this was the invasion of Utah Beach. This was our fire area right here off the beach. Uh, they had channels certain places you were supposed to be in and where you weren't supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And these are pictures of some of the men that we had on our ship at the time. Uh, our basketball team, you wonder, used to play on a deck. When the ball went over the side, that was it. And uh, some pictures of uh, Hawaii the way it was many years ago. You know Hawaii Five-O, mm -hmm. the, uh, the the King's Palace. Well, this is what it looked like. There was nothing around it. Today, all these fields are all filled. And like I say, these are different stories. 
Chinese. Again, the Italian Navy. And this way is down to Diesel School. Whereabouts are you in that picture? Uh, right here. Whereabouts? Oh, okay. Yeah, just turned 18. Is that you in jail? <laughs> we were all there kidding around. Uh, believe it or not. They, these two people decided to get in the picture. We don't know who they were. Uh, but the, the three of us were in there when, uh, let's see, we had been in, yeah, in Hawaii at the time. Yeah. You, you know, you go to these uh, carnivals and all that, and they always take pictures of uh, different ones. And we had, uh, in China, they gave, uh, we bought these uh, silk dragons that were on the cuffs and on our jackets, which are very fine uh, workmanship. And of course, this was right after World War II parade in our city of Newburgh. It's a lot different than today. And this is my wife. Just, uh, I think we just got married. No, just before I got married. Yep. That's it. Uh, can I look at this? Yeah. Um, there was one article in there. Now, was that an interview that you had uh, that was on the front page of that one paper about being in the boiler room? At, uh, yes, it was. <clears throat> oh, uh, these here, these were our... Uh, what you call a placemats of different cities where we were. Now uh, this was in Chicago. See it? Mm -hmm. Well, the 50th anniversary. I think this was Cincinnati. Yeah, this was Cincinnati. If I could copy something. This is, he gave this article about himself that was in the uh, um, copy machine out there. I can ask. Well, I, can, I can go on. Um, could, would you mind if I copied this article? No. I'll see if they have a copy machine oh. we can use out here. <clears throat> and that one that you, that interview you did in the newspaper, would you copy that maybe and put it in the folder? Let's see where it is here. Oh, this is one of the destroyers I run the fight, uh, destroy escort. Yeah. Just a rough sketch. Mm -hmm. Well, th this is what you want here. Yes, if, uh, I'll see if they. Yeah, we had okay. uh, several other people from okay. down here. Okay, I'll uh, see if I can copy these. But they uh -huh. they were right here in Newburgh, and I would meet them at the uh, Lincoln Tunnel. I get a subway from the Navy Yard to the Lincoln Tunnel. Meet them at a certain time in the evening. And come home. At five o'clock in the morning, I meet him again at the diner and come home. <laughs> and come home. So that, that gave me free transportation, really. Uh -huh. Outside of the subway, which is only a nickel or a dime at the time. But I'll, I'll bet you your family was glad once the Korean War ended. Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, you know, I got back to normal. Got uh, went into a <clears throat> line of work that I retired from after 33 years. You didn't stay in the Navy Reserve. You, you no, got out of no. My, uh, my, uh, I still had several months to go, uh -huh. but once the date line came by, I was given my discharge, which is almost six months after. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mike. Any more questions? No. Okay. Well, thank you, sir. Now you have any forms filled out?